And it doesn't sometimes even matter the size of the company. It's how you as an HR team project how much you care about the employees you're supporting. Then they will come to you. Then they will talk to you if you show that you are approachable. I think that is number one. Don't conduct your analysis in isolation because data is so incredibly powerful. Not defending just the tribe, but defending the organization. Those creative people that you really want to keep empowered, keep excited, keep motivated, keep thinking. A good experience pays dividends down the line. Theory types tend to break down in proximity. Welcome to We're Only Human, a podcast about human resources, business, technology, and the workplace. My name is Ben Eubanks, your host, and I'm so glad you're here. Hey everyone, it's Ben Eubanks, host of We're Only Human, and I'm really excited to have you here with us. As always, we're talking to different HR leaders, different TA leaders about some of the challenges, the things they're working on, lessons learned for all of us. And I'm excited to have Louise here with me from the team over at Beekeeper. We're talking about some of the work that she's done throughout her career, some of the lessons learned, and some of the really interesting things they're working on around employer retention as well, a topic I'm always excited to talk about. So Louise, welcome. Glad to have you. Great. Thank you for inviting me. I'm really happy to be here. Absolutely. Well, I have watched and followed the beekeeper team for a while. The team does a lot of work serving frontline employers around the world, helping them to support their people who are doing the the hard frontline work every day. So I'm excited for all of that. So before we get into some of the conversation we're going to dive into, would you take a minute, let the audience know more about who you are, what you do, please? Okay. So I am Swedish. I've been working in Switzerland for the last 20 years. I'm an HR leader, as you just mentioned, with over 25 years of experience in both um, technology sectors and the hospitality sector. That's where I started out. And currently, I'm Chief People Officer at Beekeeper. The role is new, but I've actually been VP of People here for four years. So okay. I've been part of Beekeeper for quite a while now. And I oversee our talent acquisition team, our HR team, and our workplace operations team, and those three teams. I'd say my passion really lies in creating people-centric strategies that really foster an inclusive culture, but also a high-performance culture. So marrying those two, it's like the tension I like to be between. Well, I'm excited to talk about some of those things. Before Mm -hmm. I get to that, actually, I have a question for you really quickly, just because I'm super curious. You have this very long and incredible journey through HR. Why HR as a career path out of everything you could have done? Ooh, Well, I knew, I definitely knew I wanted to work in like the business environment. That's always Mm -hmm. been, that's where I did my first studies, but I very quickly in my studies went towards so leadership and management studies. At the time, I'm revealing my age now, at the time there was no such thing as HR in, in Sweden when I was studying, not at the university I was in. And so organizational theory, that was the closest I could get. And so that's where I leant towards. And what has always fascinated me is I love the business side, but really how the people can really play a critical role in supporting that business. That's where I've always been fascinated. And so that's led me to, I did first do a first stint in finance and quickly realized that wasn't, (laughs) that last, that didn't even last six months. And quickly within the same company went towards HR. Yeah. That's so wonderful to hear. Now, one of my favorite episodes, my favorite interviews here on the podcast, a couple of years ago, I talked to a chief people officer who was formerly a CFO. And he said that the biggest lesson he learned, you probably learned that very early on in that transition was he said, it's so easy to reconcile numbers. You mess something up, just make a journal entry and you're good. It's hard to reconcile people because you mess with a relationship (laughs) and it takes a lot more work to recapture that. So, okay. Thank you for letting me take you back for a minute down memory lane because I was kind of curious. I always love hearing how someone ends up in that direction. And it sounds a lot like my journey too. Like I was drawn to that leadership, the how people work, how to guide and lead them and help them do their best work. That was sort of the thing that drew me into all those years ago and ended up where I am. So you've talked about a little bit, you've sort of set up this journey that you've had a beekeeper. You've had a couple of years there and just recently elevated to this chief people officer role. And I'd love to hear from you some of the things that you've been doing. Because I got a little bit of a a preview that you've been working on some things around retention. You've had some incredible results there. I'd love to hear from you what sort of strategies or things you've put in place to really drive that. Because I know all the people out there listening right now are thinking about retention, especially for their high performers. And they want to know what sort of tips or strategies you might share. Sure. So let me maybe go back a couple of years. Yeah. I think many of the tech 
companies will recognize the, the big resignation. And we experienced that as well at Beekeeper. So retention attrition was quite stable during COVID, but coming out of that, we suffered that just as many other software companies did. And so we really tried to put our heads together and see how we could really address this. And one of the things we did is we dug in really deeply and tried to understand our employee value proposition much better. So a lot of people know the concept of employee value proposition from talent more and how do we attract employees to us and what is the proposition that we have towards candidates. But we looked at it from a retention perspective. What is it we are proposing to our employees in terms of the value of staying with us? And so we looked at it from that lens. So it's it actually, by doing that, by really digging in, we had focus groups where we started really also looking at our values because we've been around, our values have been close to 10 years. And we re- we also realized that we, you know, our company had changed very much since then. So we wanted to make sure, well, first of all, is our foundation we're standing on, our company values that drive, that were actually driving and the basis for many initiatives, were they still solid? That they still reflect truly our employees' values. And so that's where we started. And one of the things that really stood out for us there is how strongly our employees felt about our mission. They are mm-hmm. were super passionate about working really on focusing on making our clients, the frontline workers, their lives better. And that just shone through. And so we thought we're onto something here. This is where employees want to stay with us. This is why they join us. And that's why they want to stay with us. This is what really, really makes their work worthwhile. And so what we did was we actually created a new value, which was called Frontline First. And when we rolled that out, we really thought about how we could harness the power of that value through all the initiatives, the internal initiatives we were doing. So we did things like we took all our internal events that we had, internal social events, internal learning events, and put a frontline theme on them. And so it meant what we wanted to do is really connect our employees even closer to what we call our just cause, which I think Simon Sinek talks about just cause. We really dug in there as well and really tried to articulate that. And helping to articulate that also helped us rally around even stronger the company around our mission and our purpose. And we made it fun as well. We did competitions, we brought in speakers, and we're continuing to do that. We got a lot of great feedback from that. And another thing we did was also we introduced something called the Frontline Days, which we actually give our employees the possibility to go and spend a whole day at one of our clients and do the work side by side, a frontline worker. And again, that's something that is truly really appreciated by employees. So that was one of the things we did, which I feel was one of the most impactful. And there were a few other things we did with our benefits as well. I don't know if you want, if you had questions around that or you want me to launch into that part of it. Sure. I'd love to hear more about the benefits side. I want at least one or two questions to come back to on the first part, but I would love to hear this piece on the benefits while the door's open. Sure. So the benefits side, we looked, what we wanted to do is look at what are the benefits we have now that are really have the most impact, which ones are really valued by our employees, and then are there any gaps that we needed to identify? And when we did that, we went through surveys, and when we assessed what came back, what we saw was that we could do better in terms of learning. Our employees were really more very hungry for more learning opportunities, mm. and also that more support in terms of mental health as well. Those are the two areas that really stood out. And so we did things, we rolled out a mental health platform, which gave our employees access to a certain number of therapy sessions, but also it was also a learning platform as well. And we have, we got a great feedback. We did a a pilot and then looked at the feedback from that. And then I have continued with that now for, for nearly two years. And we also, in terms of learning, we gave a specific budget for everyone where they could, from that budget, they could then choose what kind of learning they wanted to do. They could use that for conferences, for trainings. We give them a lot of flexibility in terms of what they want to use it for. And one key message we have to our managers around this is also around having career conversations with our employees about their long-term aspirations, but not just stopping at beekeeper. And we really push for that. We say, dare to go outside that, dare to push your employees to have 
discussions around what is actually, what do they want to do long term that's even outside a beekeeper? Because the longer they feel that they are on that, that they are acquiring skills to be on that long term path, the longer they ultimately will stay with us. So it's not that we have to find sometimes that managers are a bit scared to go there. And we try to say to them, no, don't be scared, open up that door and have those conversations. And a final thing, I would say one one of our most innovative in a way is that we created a sabbatical program, a paid sabbatical program. What we did when we looked at the data, our, our retention data, what we saw is that the vast number of people were leaving us before three years. That was seen to be the, the point in time where the majority of our employees were leaving. And so we thought if we can get them past that three years, then they seem to be staying much longer. So we thought, how can we encourage them? Because we all have our ups and downs when we're working somewhere. How can we encourage them to get through that three-year period? And we thought a sabbatical program could help them to encourage them to get past that three years. And so at the three-year mark, at the five-year mark, we offer a one-month paid sabbatical. And the idea isn't that they go and watch Netflix for that much, (laughs) sit on the couch and watch Netflix for a month. The criteria that we have is that they have a learning project, that they have a personal learning project linked. That could be doing volunteering work. That could be a massive hike. We've had so many different projects. And that I would say is the, yeah, that was one of the key initiatives that we rolled out in terms of benefits. Our goodness, I want to ask 50 questions to follow up on that. Let's start with the sabbatical part since that was most recent. So if someone else said, okay, that that sounds really interesting, Louise, how do we actually start down that path? What are some of the key elements from a business perspective? Because there's like the business continuity piece. If I just dump Louise out for a month, we've got to have her work done. We've got to accomplish that. So any tips or advice on how to make the pieces fit together on that? I think that's a brilliant idea, but there are probably a lot of objections to be like, well, that wouldn't work here for X, Y, Z reasons. And I'd love for you to knock some of those objections down potentially. It's not without its challenges and we're still learning. Let's let's be honest. It's not, there are challenges and exactly that. The business continuity one is, it can be a challenge depending on what team it is. So in some teams, we can cover each other. I had someone go out of my team quite recently. And what's key is that they plan it in advance. So you put some criteria around it that they need to make their request, you know, so much time in advance. And that they also, you put also a bit of responsibility on them. What would they suggest as a a coverage plan as well? And then in some teams you can find, and it's an opportunity to learn. So in my team, what we took was, we took it as an opportunity for one person to then learn another one, another person's job. Mm -hmm. And it actually became a, a learning opportunity for them. And we could make it work in the HR team, but where it becomes more challenging is obviously the customer facing, customer facing teams. That's when, when someone's out is obviously if you're covering more customers, that's when it becomes more challenging. And one of the things where maybe you need to think about is building in a little bit of extra um, coverage and staffing to cover those or plan ahead, forecast what, when do we think that those, those sabbaticals are going to, going to take place. And you try to plan ahead and make sure maybe you don't allow more than X number of people to be on a sabbatical in the same quarter, et cetera. It's possible, I think, with planning, but I agree. There are some challenges as well. In the end, we've slashed our attrition rates by 50%. So if you compare the both, I think that in the end, we come out, it's worthwhile. Yes, it's worthwhile. I was going to make a joke. Like you you are over town attrition, you said. How many times has a hiring manager come to you and said, hey, I just want to let you know in six months, we're going to probably need this. Usually it's, I need this person six days ago. I need yes. your help with this to make this work. Yes. So that does change some of the culture around thinking proactively about that. But once, if it's a thing that everyone's involved in, it becomes just a natural part of the fabric of the culture, mm-hmm. not this little side thing that creates problems for this group and not for that group. Like everyone figures out how to pitch in, how to make that work. So I love, love that approach. The other thing I was going to call out that I thought was really intriguing was when you talked about having your people supporting frontline workers by jumping in there alongside them for for a day and Mm -hmm. feel that. One of the favorite quotes I've had from the podcast over the years, someone mentioned that stereotypes break down in proximity. The closer we are to someone, the more likely the stereotypes we have about them will fall apart because we see they're really people. And that sort of thing, it's so easy for 
again, I'm not pointing at the beekeeper team because y'all interact with them every day, but a lot of people on the consumer side, like, oh, well, I saw that person at the grocery store. That probably wouldn't be a hard job. Or I see this person at a restaurant. That wouldn't be a hard job. And you, once you get on the other side, you're like, oh, wow, this is super difficult. And there's so much to this. And so letting them see that, it probably gives them a very healthy respect and appreciation for what they're doing. And when they come back to work, I would imagine they're even more invigorated and excited about finding ways to help them do that work better. Is that fair? That is absolutely fair. They get a different perspective. They, mm-hmm. they may very well still be respectful of their roles and know that it's a hard job, but they don't understand the some of the challenges that just they don't get to see because you're not on their side of the yeah, of the disc or the yeah, of, of their work. Okay. Tremendous. Goodness, so many good ideas in that. So the other big thing that I sort of teased at the beginning of the episode today, I want to talk to you just a little bit about your bigger picture career and some of the lessons learned that you've had from that. So you talked earlier about you try to create a people-centric culture at Beekeeper. Mm -hmm. That's one of your key driving values as an HR team, it sounds like. For all of our friends out there who are working HR every day, every single day, what sort of things would you share with them as ideas or lessons learned? Or here are some things you can be thinking about as you're trying to develop your own people-centric culture that they could take away from this episode. So if I link it back maybe to attrition as well. So I think because I do think a people centric strategy then very much helps and leads into and helping obviously retention. I think it starts very simply. You need to genuinely care about your employees. If you don't start there and show that, then the rest is very difficult. But that should just be front and center of everything you do. And as an HR team, just find ways to be very close to your employees. I mean, I've worked in different organizations, larger, smaller, and and it doesn't sometimes even matter the size of the company. It's how you as an HR team project how much you care about the employees you're supporting. Then they will come to you. Then they will talk to you if you show that you are approachable. I think that is number one. And that happens in the smallest things. In your role, you're supporting the business but you need to balance that with empathy. So even the hardest things you do, like letting someone go, if you're doing that with respect and care, then that goes also a long way. And that, and those people know how you treat those situations and they understand that you truly care about them. So you mentioned approachability as an important piece of this. As an HR team, just being approachable, not just sure, I've got five minutes, but being out there among your people, yeah. What if someone's listening here and maybe they've come into a company where HR wasn't approachable in the past and you may have had that transition yourself where you step in and your personality, your approach to HR is I'm with everybody. I'm here with you. I'm alongside you. And that's very different for them sort of jarring. I've seen that myself. So if someone steps into one of those roles, are there any tips or ideas you can give them on how to just be more accessible, be more approachable as an HR person? Because sometimes when HR steps in the room, it's like, oh, what's wrong? Instead of What's going right? And how can they help us? Any thoughts? I think there's two levels to it. There's as you're working closely with managers, I have regular one-on-ones with all the managers I support. And it's not only when there's an issue that I have check-ins with them. I have regular check-ins and talk to them about their teams. I ask how I can help. And so it's you have that regular touch point. Sometimes I think that we're brought in only when there's a challenge. Mm-hmm. But this way you're showing you want to support them side by side and be that be the person they can have bounce ideas off as well. So that's how you sort of I feel that you're building trust that way with the managers. And I, I have noticed that sometimes they're just not used to that. So you have to get them used to like through the small discussions, but regular discussions that they start opening up and, and show and you can show that you can you can support them. And that's one, I think, with managers. That's a very easy one. And I'm sure many of the HR community listening to this do that. But it's a simple one that I think we need to remind ourselves that it's important. In terms of employees, I think also as an HR leader, you're coming in and setting that expectations with your own HR team. I think sometimes that you just need to, as you said, if you're coming in and that hasn't been the norm, then it's it's not just me. It's my whole HR team need to be need to be living that as well. And having those discussions, what are the expectations? What kind of HR team do we want to be? And that proximity and the approachability is something key and something I talk about with my team. And then just being among the your employees, take every opportunity, go visit them, go drink coffee with them, be have just sit 
side by side. I don't have an office. I sit in our open space with my team. In the middle of our customer success, our sales, I sit. And so you just have that, uh, that you create that proximity that way. Love that. Some really good tips and pieces of advice in there for everybody listening, right? Approachability, proximity, be there. And if you've got a team, make sure they know that is who you want to be as be seen as a team, not just you're championing that, but you are making sure everyone has that vision of what good HR looks like being with your people. Good HR looks like being approachable. Good HR looks like conversations that may have nothing to do with HR stuff at all, but people well enough that when something does come up, you build that trust, as you mentioned there, Louise, and they can come to you with a question, with a problem, with an idea that they want to suggest. Any of those sorts of things can happen, but you've got to start with trust. Tremendous. Okay. So this has been so much fun. I've gotten some amazing notes myself and I know that everybody else listening in has as well. So if someone wants to connect, wants to learn more about the good work that you and the team of Beekeeper are doing, what's the best way to do that? I would say LinkedIn is for me, firstly, to contact me is LinkedIn. Also just Beekeeper. You can see also a lot of things that we're doing. Follow our CEO. You get some great insights of our frontline workers out there as well. That's probably, I would say, the, the best way to connect with me. Perfect. Louise, I appreciate you for joining me, for sharing some expertise, for going back in the the old memory banks with me to the the beginning of your (laughs) HR career, all those sorts of things. It's been a great conversation. Thank you. Absolutely. Everybody else out there, I hope you got some good ideas today, not just for thinking about how to create a great HR team, how to create a great connection with all of your people, but even some of the tidbits today on maybe some creative benefits on how to drive retention, just like Louise and her team have done. We'll catch you again next time on We Are Only Human. Thank you so much for joining me on the show today. I'm honored to have you as a listener. If you enjoyed this episode, please take 10 seconds to rate it at iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcast. Also, if you know a friend that could benefit from today's conversation, please pass it their way. After all, a rising tide lifts all ships. To see show notes, sponsor information, and our full show archives, visit OnlyHumanShow.com. 